Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. We'll be looking at one thought this evening that hopefully will be able to be a help to us. As you know, uh, last summer, I think last fall, we tied in one. Uh, I love studying the names of God. And, uh, specifically, over the last year, we've been looking at certain names of Jehovah. And so we find in this passage, in this text, another name for Jehovah. Well, let's start in verse 23, Exodus 15, starting in verse 23. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. Did you just turn me off? All right. Because it just sounded like you did, did it to you? All right, thank you. All right, so I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not going to use the R word. All right, so anyways, and the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Or what Mike? All right, and the uh, people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet, that he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. In verse 26 it says, And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth these. Now look at verse 27. And they came to Elam, where were twelve wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. So we go back to the end of verse 26. And the phrase that um, is a name of Jehovah is found, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. We've looked at different names of Jehovah in Psalm chapter 7. It says, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. That is the name Jehovah Elyon. Elyon is, is kind of a, a fighting name, a fighting term. And so it's the Lord Most High. All right, there's another name that's similar to that. Um, it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. It says, And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts. And that word, Lord of hosts, we sing it in a song that's uh, Lord Sabaoth. All right, and we sing it in one of the song, Lord Sabaoth is his name. That's the Jehovah Sabaoth, or Sabbath, as some would say it. That is the Lord of hosts. It's similar to this Jehovah Elyon. It is a fighting name of God. And all the names of Jehovah, once you put them there, it's because, as we started last summer and we were talking about it, when you take all that God is and all that Christ is to us, you can't put it in one name. You can't put it in one name. You can't describe Christ and what he does for us in just one term or one verb. And that's why I love these names because in Jehovah Sabaoth or Jehovah Elyon, we find that God is a fighting God. He is a, a God of hosts. And that means that when I have Christ on my side, that I can defeat almost anything. And that's what he says. And then he said that uh, we are more than, that's uh, Romans chapter 8, we are more than conquerors. All right, we're more than conquerors, so that's one name. We looked at um, a couple other names last summer. One was uh, Jehovah Nisi, and that's found in Exodus 17, just two chapters later in the text. That's when Joshua was called by Moses, and uh, he was told to go fight with Amalek. And as Joshua uh, was fighting with Amalek, Moses' arms got tired. And it says in Exodus 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And what happened was Amalek was defeated because Joshua and the others uh, were able to uh, defeat uh, the Amalekites, Amalekites, and it says, And 
Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. All right, and so all these names, Je Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Elyon. Uh, we talked last summer about uh, Jehovah Makedesh. That's a harder one, but it means the Lord that sanctifies. And what that temp what is that? What is that indicating to you and I? All of these are pictures of what Christ does in our lives and through our lives. So Christ can fight for us. All right, Christ can comfort us. That's Jehovah Shalom. All right, the, the Lord, my peace. He can comfort me. But we come to this phrase here, and this is known as Jehovah Rapha. It says, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. And what does that mean? What does it mean that Christ can heal us? Well, we're looking at a passage here, and we're going to go through the story a little bit, and we're going to see that the children of Israel are going through a tough time, but what they needed to do is learn that Christ is the one that we have to turn to when we're having problems. Christ is the one that we need to get to. It's not in, and, and I love church. And I love going to church. And I love uh, the people and the friendship that I have at church. And I love there's different things that I have in the Christian life. But there does come some times that only Christ can meet those needs. And until you get to that place in your Christian life, and you will have times of heartache, and you will have times of trial, and you will have times of tribulation, but God is bringing them there so that you can truly come to find that there is a Jehovah Rapha. There is a God, there is a Christ that can bring healing to you. Nobody else may be able to heal you, but Christ can. We want to find him, finding Jehovah Rapha. Heavenly Father, I pray that this evening you would give us understanding, give us wisdom and guidance, discernment as we go through scriptures. Help us not to take liberties with your word. It's precious. And Lord, we do not take for granted that we have it. It costs lives down through the centuries for us to have this precious word. We don't want to take liberties with it. So Holy Spirit, guide my thoughts, guide my words. Lord, as always, I ask for you to do that which I can, and that is to speak to hearts. Power the message, Lord. Make it lasting. Make it effective, because you can do that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Here in this passage, then we see a number of different things, and we'll go through this passage and look at it, but the Christian life is not always uh, one big spiritual high. Sometimes there's some dry times. And so in this passage, we're given some thoughts in relation to that. You know, there are times when we're just thirsty, when we desire, um, we just want, it seems like, you know, I'm, I'm not getting what I need. And that's, that's true in this Christian walk. If you think that you're just going to be on this spiritual plateau and you're never, you're never going to, you're never going to have a valley and it's always going to be mountaintop experiences, well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that isn't this life. This life, there's high points and there's low points, and some of that is because we have to, in this life, deal with this flesh, this old nature. And this old nature, it seems like every time it's just a high plateau, guess what happens? I start thinking that it's me. I, th I start thinking that it's uh, my good works. I start thinking that it's all because of the things I've done and I'm so good and God just has to do it and then boom. Down on the bottom again and God's saying, hey, you know what? Um, remember, I'm the reason. I'm the reason you're anything. So sometimes there's some spiritual lows. Sometimes there's spiritual dry times. And that's what we come to in this passage. So I want to I wanna look at it and try to draw out some lessons for us. So what are some lessons? Well, notice in the text here, if you go back to the beginning of this, if you go back to chapter 14, and then we'll, all right, if you go back to chapter 14, notice that in chapter 14, 
Pharaoh is pursuing the Israelites. So this is, most of us understand it, they've been delivered from Egypt. Pharaoh has uh, the, the ten plagues, and they were, the member of the ten plagues, all of those were an attack on the Egyptian gods. And so the last plague... Uh, was the, the attack against, and there's uh, names for each of these gods, but the, the, the attack was specifically against, because what did the pharaohs believe? That Pharaoh himself was God. So Pharaoh's son was a god, and so when God took the firstborn son of Pharaoh, he attacked the ultimate god of the Egyptians. Because Pharaoh was God, and so each one of them was an attack against the God of the Egyptians. And so now they are delivered from these Egyptians. They're coming up to the Red Sea, but there's a huge Red Sea. There's a problem. Pharaoh then pursues the Israelites. And fear takes over, and that's found in verse 10. And then in verse 13, notice it says, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not. Stand still, and I love this, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today. Ye shall see them again no more forever. And notice, look at what it says in verse 14. This is kind of the, the Lord's Sabbath, Jehovah Sabbath, uh, Jehovah Elyon. Here it is. Notice what he says. The Lord shall fight for you. You shall hold your peace. See, here comes Christ, the great deliverer. And what happens? They're delivered. And as we see in chapter 15 then, this is the first contemporary praise service. Because what happens? Chapter 1, then sang Moses unto the children of Israel, this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. And man, you can almost see it going. And then his sister gets involved because you see that towards the end. And verse 17, thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his uh, chariot and with his horsemen into the sea. The Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. And then verse 20, here comes Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron. And she took a timbrel and she got into the service. Timbrel in her hand and all the women went out after it. So this is probably why there was the dry season coming up. Oh, we don't have time to deal with that, all right? And all the women went out after her with timbrels and with dances. And Miriam answered, said, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. Now, I know that this is scripture. I know that it's inspired. And so then every word is important, and I think this is referring to the Ladies, the children of Israel, and they're singing and they're shouting, they're rejoicing. Notice what they said in verse 22. I don't think it's by accident. So who? Hello? So who? What did he do? Brought Israel from the Red Sea. Now remember, they're singing, and I know beforehand they're saying the Lord hath done it, but in somewhere in their mind... It's Moses. Because guess what happens to you and I? We get very man-centered. We get very man-centered in what we do. And then we come to verse 23, and when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah. Now, if you notice in verse 22, so all this is going on, they're excited, and they start traveling three days. Now, when we talk of a wilderness, sometimes around us is called wilderness. You can go up into the wilderness of the UP. You can go into the wilderness of the Minnesota or the uh, Canadian border there, and you have the wilderness of the boundary waters. That is not the wilderness that this is talking about, just so you know. All right, the wilderness that they're talking about is a dry, and it's dusty. I mean, it is not, there's not any trees, it's, it's very dry. There's nothing. 
So one day and a couple million people are traveling, no water. Two days, a couple million people. All right, and as we were talking this morning, there's a whole lot of little kids are, are we there yet? Are we there yet? All right. The third day, still nothing going on. And so what is, what's going on here? It's dry. Oh, it's a problem. I understand it's a problem. There's a couple million people and they need some water. So how do I, how do I get to the place that I can find Jehovah Rapha? Well, the first thing here is don't forget what God did for you in the past. Did you, did you hear what they were doing? Hey, Miriam, hey, prophetess, hey, can you pick up the timber a little bit? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm dry. You know what? That shouting and praise service just kind of made me hoarse. Come on, Miriam. What were they just praising God for? Because a little bit before, their young men were being sacrificed, were being taken away from them, being uh, killed, and they were no longer allowed to have men children. They were being taken away from them. They were in slavery. They were in bondage. And God came in and wiped it out. And then... The enemy comes and they cry out to Moses again and say, come on, did he just deliver us so that we die right here? And God says, wait a minute, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and you're going to see Jehovah, the Lord, he will fight for you. And the waters were parted and they walked across dry ground and not just that, but all their enemies. Did you notice in the passage it said that they were killed forever and that's something for you and I because when I was saved and that's what Egypt Egypt is a picture of my sinful life and my sinful past and Egypt is there and it had a grip on me it had made me a slave to sin I couldn't do anything but hallelujah for Jesus Christ because through his shed blood he saved me he delivered me and he defeated Satan, not just for one time. I am saved forever. Forever the enemy is defeated. So what should I do when I find myself in a dry time and I go for the water? Did you notice what happened? They went for the water and there was water there and it was bitter. You know, there are times that you're going to you're going to come up and you're going to have to drink or you're going to, have to, uh, you're going to have to partake of some bitter water. It's not always fun and games. So what should I do? I can remember that my enemy has been destroyed forever. You know, I, I may have to partake of a, a little bit of water here and it may be a dry spell, but that's all that the enemy has right now. All he can do is give me a little physical thirst because spiritually, I have tasted of the water and I'll never thirst again. So physically, he may be able to do something to me, but spiritually, remember what Jesus has done. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. So the first thing we see is that don't forget what God did for you in the past, but then... And that's seen in those past passages. But then look at verse 23 and 24. When they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Mara. That means bitter. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? I understand this, but this is, this is my second thing when I'm coming up to this dry time. So don't forget what God did in the past. But then don't magnify your present problem. I know you're thirsty, but get over it a little bit, can you? Some people sitting here, and I, all right, I'm not trying to just make fun of you because all right, we all do it. You know what happens to all of us? All of us sometimes have issues, and our issue surpasses anything 
that I believe even, I mean, you could go to Paul in the, the prison, right? even Paul, John the Baptist, when he got his head cut off, our problem is at that level or greater. Because I know John the Baptist doesn't have a head. I understand that. And Paul, he doesn't have it. And there's James, and he's crucified upside down. But you don't know. You don't know the itchies that I have right now. I mean, sometimes we magnify this problem, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know what? You're thirsty. I understand that. I know you need a little bit of water. But step back from the problem, right, and don't magnify it. Don't just keep building it bigger and bigger and bigger because what, one of the things that the devil wants you to do is think that you're the only one. And that goes back to even temptation sometimes, and that's 1 Corinthians 10. There, there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Now, what does that mean? That means that all of us are tempted. All of us. And whether you like to admit it or not, Jesus was tempted. Because that's also in the Bible. It helps when you read the Bible. And when you read the Bible, what you find is your problem, when you magnify the problem, you're nailing, you're nailing the problem. The problem is me. You have an eye problem. And I understand that all of us have problems, but when my focus is me, when it's always about me, then I have a problem. Because this life is not about me. And it's all, and you say, well, you don't understand. I understand. You know, and I'm glad I don't because I'd never want to be you. All right? And you say, oh, you're getting all sarcastic. I know, that's me. All right, but I'm just saying that sometimes it just amazes me because nobody else has ever experienced child rearing. Nobody. Okay. All right, just, for, just so you know, just for hundreds, yay, thousands of years, people have had children. That's why you're here. Just so you know that. Well, you don't understand. I mean, this is different. No, it's not different. Because what God is doing is maybe taking you into a dry spell so that you can find that Christ can heal you. That's where he wants you to get to. And I know even in my own life, when I start getting that little pity party and I start crabbing and I start complaining, God starts saying, hey, listen, find me. Find me. That's what God wants. Find God. Because what you'll find is Jehovah Rapha, he can heal it. Whatever the problem is, he can heal it. So we don't forget what God did in the past. We don't magnify our present problem. But then look at verse 25. So Moses, I love this. What does he do? Smart answer, he cried unto the Lord. And guess what the Lord did? Now, this, this cracks me up. I'm thinking I'm Moses, okay? And I know I've been ruined because I work with teenagers so long. All right, so there's a warped, all kinds of, there's all kinds of issues. I'm in therapy, all kinds of things, trying to get help, all right? And so thank you for that. But I'm trying not to magnify the problem, all right? But here in this passage, notice what it says. He cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. Now, I'm thinking, I, I'm like, oh, Lord, help me. Psst. Lord, help me. Psst. Lord. All right, and there you are. It's like, hey, there's a tree. Like, you know what? Could you just leave me alone? I don't know who's talking back there. But I'm not thinking about the little bush back there. <laughs> Just guess what? Don't overlook then God's solution. 
Don't overlook God's solution. I think sometimes God is there and he's telling you, here it is, here it is, here it is. You say, all right, so let's go to church. Read your Bible. Pray. Yeah. I want something bigger. I want, I want the clouds to come together and they say, you know, whatever business. They like, quit. Ooh, yeah. I saw it. I saw it. You know what? That could be, as Charles Dickens says, a bad bit of beef. <laughs> All right, that's what it could be. I don't know what it may be, but it could be something. But I don't know that necessarily the clouds coming together and forming a word, all of us are thinking, I don't know. I'm not thinking that's there. But guess what? God sometimes has some simple solutions. What are some of his simple solutions? Even in dry times, I can cry out to the Lord. Isn't that what Moses did? He cried out to the Lord. Even in dry times, I can listen. Did you notice in verse 20 says, 26 it says, and he said, if thou wilt diligently hearken to my voice. So what's some simple things? I can cry out to God. I can listen to God. What is that talking about? What is that for you and I today? I can pray. I can get in God's word. It amazes me how little we know of this book. And yet you're saying that you're, you're resting your eternal destiny on this? Do you know what that means? But I think that eternal destiny sometimes is flippant for us because we really don't know what that means. And so it's easy to me, for me to say, yeah, well, my future is set. But if I really believe it, this book... This book is everything. So I better know it. I better be in it. I better be thinking about it. I better be meditating upon it. Musing, the, the word is. Thinking. Why? Because there's some things that I can do. God's solution. Even in dry times, I can pray. I can obey. I can rely on God's goodness. What did God say? For I am the Lord that healeth thee. That's what he told Moses. You can rely on me. You know, you can rely on God. There are all kinds of things that will let you down. Even yourself, you know that. I let myself down. You know, sometimes each and every one of us, we sometimes, uh, just recently, I think it was Monday night, our quartet was practicing. We're trying to work on uh, uh, the quartets, just so you know. We're, we're going to do a quartet CD. Do a quartet CD. So on Monday, we came together and we're practicing, recording, and then they played it back. <laughs> oh, my word. How disgusting. I mean, we were thinking that we were rising. We were pretty sure that other, even though they're the world, but CBS Records and other people, they, I know they're worldly, but they're secretly listening in and saying, wow, if we had voices like that, if they would just go public with this, it would, it would, it would rock the nation. I mean, in a good way, not in rock and roll way, but in a good way. It would be unbelievable. But you know what? Even ourselves, when we get all high and mighty, and then all of a sudden, you really see yourself, you're like, wow. You know what? I, God, I, I can't rely on myself. Man, I, if I rely on myself, I'm just going to get more thirsty I'm not gonna get the need met but this is what I can tell you you can always rely on God always all the years of serving God you know what I've 
I've never seen God forsake his own. He doesn't. He doesn't. When you turn to God, isn't that what he says? You draw nigh to me. What does he promise you? I'll draw nigh. You can draw nigh to maybe something else. Maybe you, you draw nigh to your psycho uh, therapy. You can draw nigh to your doctor. You can draw nigh to something else. And maybe they'll let you down. But when you draw nigh to God, he promises you. He'll be there. He'll draw nigh to you. So we see a couple of things in our passage. We're not magnifying our present problem. We're not forgetting about what God did in the past. We're not overlooking God's solution. Now, I know there's commentators. Uh, commentators. I was just reading one this afternoon. That's why I read some and uh, preacher boys. That's why you read them and you come up with your own opinion. And I've been studying this for weeks, maybe even a year and you know what? I disagree with some of the commentators, and I'm not afraid to do that. You know why? Because the commentator isn't the Holy Spirit. But what they say in this passage, there was one guy even this afternoon, he's like, you know what? In the whole context, people like to take it and say that the tree represents Christ. Well, I'm like, that's actually pretty good. I kind of like that. It's like, but it's not there in the context. I'm like, well, what's Jehovah the Lord that healeth me. I'm pretty sure that is the name for Christ. So he's actually right there, whether you know it or not, Mr. Big Dude. Because you know what? I think it is appropriate that here is a tree, and the tree takes away what? The tree makes the water good. And I know, I, I know you, can take a, you can take an analogy and you can make it and stretch it, but really in this case, what happened? They're spiritually dry. The water's bitter. And there's times that we're spiritually dry and everything seems bitter to us. So what's the solution? The tree was put into the water. And what is that? Uh, you know, even uh, Christ... Christ, one of his names in the Old Testament, it was referred to as the branch. And Christ, this is what I can tell you. Anything that Christ touches becomes good. And you know that. And yet sometimes in our life, I try to go on my own. And even in this passage, I think it's fitting that the Bible refers to the children of Israel after glorifying God. And they say, and Moses delivered us from the Red Sea. And you notice, as soon as trouble came, where did the blame go? Where did the blame go? To Moses. And you know what will happen in your life? You're going to be the same way. I'm the same way. As soon as trouble comes into my life, I'm going to look at the principal. I'm going to look at the youth pastor. Cause, I mean, I used, to, I used to not like that, but I'm thinking that's a pretty good one right now. All right, because there's a lot of problems that have come into my family. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to finish the thought, but you guys are thinking it. There's a whole lot of problems that come into my family because of you know what I mean? Oh, think about it. Think about it. We could park right there. But guess what? That is a natural reaction. You see the children of Israel. What happened? Bitter water? It's Moses' fault. I, well, I don't know how in the world it's his fault. I mean, what's he supposed to do? I mean, later on, it didn't even happen yet. If you look in the context, they hadn't seen him like, hey, water. And it starts flowing. And he gets mad like, boom. No, I am beats it. They haven't seen that yet. So they don't know what skills he's got for bringing water out. They don't need it. They don't see that yet. But this is what's happening. As soon as problems occur, what happens? They start saying, you know what? It is the leader's fault. You're going to be the same way. I'm going to be the same way. I'm going to try to point, point out to the man and say, it's his fault when actually, who's leading them, remember? Remember in the passage, what, what led them by day? Up, what led them by, by day? A pillar of fire, right? And what led them by night? 
A pillar of cloud, right? A cloud by, a cloud, was it a cloud? No, a cloud by day, sorry, and fire by night. Sorry, you guys are all looking like, you don't know your scripture. It's the leader's fault. Yeah, I, I, I saw you there. All right. All right, so it's, 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 what is it by day? Cloud and fire by night. So God is leading them, so he leads them into dry. Ooh. Yeah, so it's God's fault. But you better be careful. You better be careful because God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. I, he, he knows everything. He knows what he's doing. Yes, you can trust him. So he's leading them there because notice what happens in verse 27. And they came to Elam where were 12 wells of water, and that is three score and ten. All right, and again, numerology that's 70, so that's seven times ten. Okay, and in numerology, seven is perfection, and so it's ten times perfection. Twelve wells of water, what were there? There were how many tri tribes? Twelve. So, what is God saying to these people? I have enough for all you need. For all your needs, I have water. And what's interesting is, this is only a few miles away. They came to Elam. I can't remember exactly uh, how long it was, but I think it was just a, a few miles. And after a few miles, they come to Elam. So you know what? God already had a solution for him but he wanted to teach him a lesson. And what is the lesson? The lesson is you can find Jehovah Rapha. You having a dry time? Drinking some bitter water? Maybe God led you there. Why did God lead you there? Because it's not always hunky-dory. Read the Bible. In fact, I, I, you know, my, my, my daughter, I mean, she got the gift too. She got the gift of I call the critical spirit, but I'll, 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 I'll let you have it right now. Because we were talking about my class, and she's like, Dad, we always know in CE what books you're reading. I'm like, you know what, daughter, that is very hurtful. I'm trying to share tidbits of nuggets of wisdom. And she's like, yeah, but you kind of just go off because you're reading some book. I'm like, you know what, it's very harsh. I'm not going to beat you right now because you're getting kind of old. All right. But it is kind of true. Because, you know, and I'm, I'm doing lessons for next semester, so this is proving a point, right? Doing lessons, and I'm reading about biblical leadership, and the, re the reason is because I cannot stand what the majority of people think about biblical leadership. Because this is what the majority of people do. They go and they read a secular book of a CEO of Apple or IBM or whatever who are pagans, and I, they don't even care about God, but they may have some wisdom. No, they don't. They got worldly wisdom, which is carnal, devilish, sensual, according to James, all right? It's not good stuff. So, oh, I'm going to, no, I want to go to the Bible. And you know what I found in biblical leadership? A biblical leader is a servant, he's submissive, and he suffers. That's why you find Paul in the book of Timothy saying, hey, come on. Why don't you serve? It's good to be called into the ministry, guys. You know why? Because in Paul's time, nobody wanted to. Why? Because you were going to suffer. You're gonna, you might get your head cut off. They hated you. You might end up in Nero's jail, in the dungeon. But now, you might get polished white teeth. You might own a $16 million mansion with a private jet. You know why? Because we don't even understand what the Bible means anymore. It's silliness that's out there. And sometimes that's why God brings us into a dry time. Because in those dry times, in that suffering, in that submission time, God is saying, I'm here. Find Jehovah Rapha. He is the Lord that heals. 
There's a story several years ago as a millionaire who was asked to speak to a class of sixth grade students. It was in East Harlem. And he thought, you know what, what am I supposed to say to inspire these students? Most of them are going to drop out of school. He scrapped his polished speech. He told them to stay in school. Okay. Then he said, I'm going to take all your names down. And then he said, you finish school, and I will pay your way to college. And he took their names down. Later, one of the students told someone, I had something to look forward to. Something waiting for me. He said it was a golden feeling. And guess what? That class, 90% graduated and went to college. Now, why? There's one word, hope. You know, when I come to a dry time and I find Jehovah Rapha, you know what it gives me? Hope. It's not in me. It's not in, in some therapy. It's not in some uh, get-rich-quick scheme. It's not in whatever you may have in, in this world. It's not in any of that. What is it? It's a hope in Jesus Christ. Because what is Jesus? Jesus is the hope of glory. That's what he is. That's why more than anything, if I can do this, I want to point you to Christ. Why? You know what? Because the preaching of the, of the cross, it's foolish to a lot of people. But when you find Christ, no matter where you're at, all around this world, you know what you'll have? You'll have the hope you need. I'll share a closing story. We were yesterday. We, uh, sounds weird, but <laughs> we had breakfast in couts at 10.30 in the morning. There was, uh, you know, we challenged our girls to witness and try to be a testimony, and there was a girl that they met in the summertime and the girls said, oh, you know what, maybe I'll come. And they've been in contact. And so the parents got a hold of us and said, hey, you know what? Um, we'd just like to meet, though, for breakfast. What about meeting in couts? Like, all right, couts. That's pretty close. Let me carve out a couple hours or a half a day. So we get down there, and the man's a pastor and Roselawn, Baptist pastor. Not exactly our strength. But he starts talking about Christ and how he got saved, how his wife got saved, and how that they're homeschooling and trying to raise their kids for the Lord. Just talking, it was just shocking to me. Then, the shocker of all, he looked at me. Now, here we are in couts. It's a pastor in Roselawn, Indiana, which I have no clue still. I just know it's kind of one of Demodish down there. And so he goes, do you know Jack Lamb? I'm like, um, he went to our college. He's a pastor in Los Angeles right now. And I knew that he had, when he left, he went and pastored, tried to start a church in Miami, Arizona, which I asked Pastor Armacos, it's hard to find it. He goes, I know him. He said, I used to be, I would call myself a pagan. So then he got my attention. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, I grew up in Arizona. And there was this guy that was at my work, and he would say, I'm bivocational. I had no idea what that meant. I guess it meant that he had to work and pastor and he worked at a prison in Arizona. He said he brought this Gideon Bible, and he would read it, break time, lunch time, and man, it got me interested, so I went home and looked up on the internet any question I could find to trip him up. I could never trip him up. 
He said, then I started saying, I just want to know. So I just asked him questions. That went on for months. And then he told me, he says, you know what? There's probably Christian radio uh, stations. This is Pastor Lamb that was telling him. He said, you know what? Why don't you just find some sermons and listen to them? He said, you know what? I found a guy, and it was right after I got off my shift, and for 30 sermons he preached on the Ten Commandments on Christian radio. He said, I was under so much conviction that finally I got saved. I just, I'm saying, my mouth just was dropping. I'm like, what in the world? And I remember getting letters from Jack Lamb because in Miami, Arizona, now he's in L.A. trying to start a church. And he would write saying how hard it was. It was dry, Arizona, right? Hello. <laughs> it was hard. But I'm going to write him this week. As you know what? There's a man that is pastoring now. His wife is saved. He's trying to raise his family for the Lord. Why? Because a guy in a dry time said, there are some things I can do. I can still be a witness. I can still pray. I can still read my Bible. I can still do those things. One other thing. Remember when Pastor Gilmore was here? And on Sunday night, it's pretty heartfelt because his wife has just passed away. And it was hard. And he was saying, sometimes you don't understand. Afterwards, we stood down here. And you know what he told me? Down in Mexico where they got the treatment. Five people are going to heaven because of them he said i don't understand it's really hard but there are five people that are going to heaven how do you put a price tag on that i i don't know how the bible says you can't put a price tag on it now would he like to not have that dry time yeah i think he would say i'd like to not have it it's really hard right now but there's five people in heaven Hey, Pastor Lamb, what, what, was it hard? Was it dry? Yes, but there's a man that's pastoring and there's a family now saved and trying to do something for God. Why? Because sometimes in dry times, we have to find Jehovah Rapha. And even during those times where we're finding him, guess what we can do? We can do what we know we should do. And what is that? Pray read my Bible, get to church. There are some things that the Bible just commands even in a dry time. And maybe then just find a little extra time. And what you'll find is God will meet with you.